Welcome everybody. Um, we have the um, the New York Marine Rescue Center today presenting on the um, endangered species in New York waters and they work out of um, the Long Island Aquarium. So at the end of the presentation um, we'll open it up for questions. Um, if you have something that um, pertains specifically to one of the slides, if you have a, ch uh, a question you can go ahead and um, and uh, write your question up in the chat and we'll, we'll share that with her. Otherwise we will um, be taking questions at the end. All right, so I, I guess I will go ahead and let you get started. Uh, thanks All for right. joining. Well, thank you. Um, so my name is Nicole. I am the education and volunteer coordinator for the New York Marine Rescue Center. Um, uh, we are a nonprofit organization whose mission is to protect and preserve the marine environment through conservation efforts, including rescue, rehabilitation, education, and research. Now, we are the primary response team for sick and injured seals, sea turtles, dolphins, porpoise, and small tooth whales, and we maintain the only rehabilitation facility for seals and sea turtles in the state of New York. Now we are part of a network called GARFO, which is the Greater Atlantic Regional Fisheries Office. And that spans from Maine to Virginia. I apologize if you can hear my bird in the background. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm very sorry. Uh, he uh, likes to talk a little bit. Um, now, together with these other organizations, we do work to promote and provide marine conservation, and we do that in a couple of different ways. Um, so we're able to share data with our partners to identify trends that we're seeing in the populations of the animals, um, as well as any uh, illnesses that we're seeing commonly. Um, now, we're also able to share resources uh, in regards to rehabilitating these animals as well. Um, so for instance, uh, last year we were actually able to take in 15 sea turtles from the New England Aquarium because they had such a large stranding season. And so if we were to get so many animals in and we didn't have enough room for them, we could reach out to other networks and see if they were able to take them in. Now we are located in Riverhead. Uh, like Lynn said, we are in the Long Island Aquarium. Um, so we are two separate organizations, just within one building. Um, so our hospital area is right inside this red rectangle. So now that you have a little bit of extra information about our organization today, we are here to talk about endangered species. So all threatened and endangered species are protected by the Endangered Species Act of 1973. Uh, the Endangered Species Act was uh, put together to uh, put into place to uh, help the conservation of species whose populations have decreased significantly. Um, it prohibits the authorized or unauthorized take, uh, possession, sale, and transport of endangered species. Um, and so this term take means to harass, harm, pursue, hunt, shoot, wound, kill, trap, capture, uh, collect, all of those things. So it covers a wide variety of things that you are um, not allowed to do with these animals. Uh, it's also illegal to attempt any of these, uh, this conduct. So this act here also gives the authority to charge those violating this act with civil or criminal penalties. Um, aside from that, it also allows for um, the protection of not only the animals, but their habitat as well. Um, so protecting an animal's habitat can be just as important as protecting the animals themselves.
So there are seven species of sea turtles in the world and all of them are considered threatened or endangered and we see four of them uh, in New York waters. So the first is the Kemp's Ridley. Um, so now with these slides, you are going to see a picture of the animal and then down in the bottom right is a map of their distribution and where you can find them in the world. Um, so the dark blue area is going to be their natural habitat. Um, so the Kemp's Ridley sea turtles, they are the most critically endangered of all the sea turtle species. Along with being the most critically endangered of all sea turtles, uh, they are also the smallest. They are only reaching lengths of two to two and a half feet and weighing in at about 80 to 110 pounds. Uh, so even though they're the smallest, they still get to be a pretty good size. Now their main habitat uh, is the Gulf of Mexico uh, down here, uh, but they can be seen all along the eastern coast of the United States and as far north as Nova Scotia. Now before the mid 20th century, uh, these turtles were considered abundant in the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, now during the late 1940s, it was recorded um, that tens of thousands of these sea turtles were nesting in the beaches of Rancho Nuevo, Mexico. Now, uh, Kemp's Ridley sea turtles, when they nest, um, they do it in one large event called the Aribatus. Uh, so the female sea turtles will come up on the beach all at one time uh, and nest simultaneously. Um, in 1947, there was an estimated 42,000 sea turtles that came up and nested in one day. Now, between the 1940s and the 1980s, these turtles experienced a severe decline in their population. Um, in 1985, a record low of 702 nests were recorded, and that represents only about 250 individual females. So it went from 42,000 in one day to 250. So there were um, extremely intensive conservation actions that were put into place and the populations did begin to rise, um, increasing by 15% each year through 2009. Now this unfortunately abruptly came to a halt in 2010 and this also happened to be the year that the BP oil spill happened in the Gulf of Mexico. So that oil spill spilled uh, just about 210 million gallons of oil into the Gulf. So it had such a great impact uh, on the population of animals. Now nesting in the following years uh, did remain lower than the average of 2009, uh, just until recently, until 2017, uh, when the numbers of nests uh, reached nearly 25,000. So that's a really great increase. It's unclear at this time if those numbers will continue to grow, but that's really the hope and the goal for these. Now, another sea turtle that we have uh, in our waters that is considered endangered throughout its range is the leatherback sea turtle. And again, you can see that these guys have a much wider distribution uh, than the Kemp's Ridley sea turtles do. Now leatherback sea turtles are the largest of all the sea turtles and they can reach lengths of up to seven feet and weighing in at about 2,000 pounds. So they're like mini Volkswagen bugs riding around there <laughs> in the sea. Um, now they are the only living soft shell sea turtle and that is actually where they get their name from. So instead of having that hard shell on their back, um, they have smaller um, bones called ossicles and it's covered by a leathery skin. Now, leatherback sea turtles, again, they have the largest distribution of all the sea turtles. And that's because there are 
kind of able to regulate their body temperature due to their large size. Um, so sea turtles, they're reptiles, um, they rely on the water temperature around them to regulate their body temperature. Uh, but because leatherback sea turtles are so large, uh, they have what's called, um, referred to as gigantothermy, uh, where leatherbacks are able to keep their body temperature between five and 10 degrees higher than the water temperature around them. Um, so that enables them to be seen in colder climates than the other sea turtles. Now these guys, they are highly migratory animals. Um, they're very pelagic offshore animals um, and they can be seen traveling over 10,000 miles between their nesting and their foraging grounds. Now nesting populations of leatherback sea turtles are very hard to determine uh, because female leatherbacks often don't return to the same uh, beach that they usually nest on every year. So they'll go to different areas um, where a lot of sea turtles are known to return to the same beach each time they nest. Um, however, this population of leatherback sea turtles is estimated to have decreased by about 40% in the last three generations of these animals. And their most important uh, nesting beach is located off the coast of Africa. Um, now many of the populations of leatherbacks are continuing to decrease. However, in the Caribbean, the Atlantic, and the Gulf of Mexico, they are generally starting to increase. Again, like the Kemp's release, we're hoping that that is going to be uh, the trajectory for these populations moving forward, um, as well as changing the direction of the other populations as well. Now, I did just want to mention briefly the loggerhead, which is on the left, and the green sea turtle, which are on the right. Uh, these are the other two types of sea turtles that we can see in New York waters. Um, now they are considered threatened in our area, but there are other populations of them around the world that are considered endangered. Um, so while they're not endangered here, they're endangered in other areas. And so I just wanted to mention them briefly. Um, there are nine distinct populations of loggerhead sea turtles and five of them are listed as endangered. And for the green sea turtles, there's 11 uh, different populations of green sea turtles, and four of them are listed as endangered. Now, the biggest threats um, for these guys are bycatch, harvest of eggs, ocean pollution, and marine debris, uh, vessel strike, nesting beach habitat loss and alteration, um, and, and intentional killing. Uh, now, a large vessel with bycatch, um, a lot of the large vessels, they will go out with the intent to catch fish and unfortunately end up catching sea turtles in the process. Um, now, a lot of these boats are actually required to have uh, TEDs, which are turtle excluder devices. Uh, in their nets. So this allows for the sea turtles to be able to escape from these nets through the bottom. Um, there's a hatch at the bottom that would allow the sea turtles to get out of the net uh, while keeping the fish inside. Now with the harvest of eggs, this is something that is illegal in the United States, but is not illegal everywhere. Um, so in some areas, uh, these eggs will be harvested for food, uh, which can definitely have a large effect on these populations um, and new generations of these animals. So for ocean pollution and marine debris, um, these animals, they can become uh, entangled as well as possibly ingest the marine debris. Um, things like plastic bags in the environment look like jellyfish which or squid, which is part of their 
natural food source. And so um, a plastic bag floating in the water can be confused with these, uh, their, their natural food source, and so they can accidentally ingest them. Um, other things like um, oil spills and things like that can also affect these animals as well. Now, sea turtles in the water, um, they can certainly be difficult to see. A lot of them are dark in color. And they're not always at the surface, and so they do have to come up to breathe, and so they can kind of pop up out of nowhere. And so for boaters that are out in the water, it might be difficult for them to be able to see them in, a, in the water and avoid them. Uh, so unfortunately, vessel strikes are something that we do see often. Uh, this past year we had two loggerhead sea turtles that were in our care um, that had boat strike injuries. Um, now one of them has already been released this year uh, which is really exciting for us. We were actually able to put a satellite tag on this sea turtle so that we can um, see what the behavior of this animal is after being released. Uh, one of them is still in our care but is getting ready to be released soon as well. Now nesting beach habitat loss and alteration is another big one for these animals. Um, with the development of these areas and putting houses on the coastline and changing the chemistry of the beaches, it can definitely affect whether they will come back and use these beaches for nesting. Um, or if they do come back, it can affect the success of the nest and the hatchlings. Um, so if they're used to coming to a certain beach, but now there's a house there, they might not be able to travel as far up the beach as they would need to to lay their eggs. So it can become inundated with water and can really affect the success of the nesting and the hatchlings. Um, another big cause of um, or issue for these animals is the lighting on the beaches as well. Um, so normally sea turtles, uh, when they hatch, they'll actually hatch at night and they will use the light from the moon to find the water. So if you have a lot of houses that are uh, on the coastline, on the water where these sea turtles are hatching and they have their lights on, it can be very confusing for these hatchlings and they can end up going in the wrong direction and not being able to find the water. Um, so in places like Florida that have a lot of um, a lot of sea turtles that nest there and have hatchlings there. Um, there are actually regulations that during the hatching season, people do have to keep their lights off on the beaches um, so that they don't affect turtles. And then the last is the intentional killing of these animals. So this kind of goes hand in hand with the harvesting of eggs. So again, in the United States, it's illegal to kill a sea turtle. Um, however, it is not everywhere. Um, so they are harvested for their meat and they are also harvested for their shells. Um, their shells they can use to make different kinds of jewelry. Um, so when you're taking both the females that are coming up on the beach to, uh, to nest and then also taking the eggs, they're having a multi-generational effect on the populations of these animals. So why is it important um, that we protect these animals? And it's really because that sea turtles play an important role in the marine ecosystem. Uh, the different species play different roles. For instance, the leatherback sea turtles, their main diet consists of jellyfish. Now they can eat anywhere from 300 to 400 pounds of jellyfish in one day. So they're really integral in the uh, controlling of the populations of jellyfish. Now the green sea turtles, uh, I like to call them the lawn mowers of the sea. Uh, now they're eating a lot of seagrass and vegetation 
And the way that they eat these plants is that they actually clip it from the bottom of the plant. Um, and so when they do that, any excess that they don't eat, it's taken away in the current. And so by having it taken away in the current, it keeps these plants from dying right in that area and creating uh, toxic slime mold. It also keeps the seagrass from growing too tall. Now tall seagrass can actually affect uh, ocean currents and it can also shade the bottom area and limit the growth of other vegetation and plants that are there as well. So there's a lot of different things that sea turtles do that uh, really affect the marine environment. And so it's really important that we protect them. Now sea turtles are not the only animals that we have in our waters that are endangered. Uh, we also have whales. So we're really lucky uh, on Long Island to have such a diverse marine ecosystem with so many animals. Now in this presentation, uh, the whales that I'm gonna talk about, they are protected by the Endangered Species Act, like I mentioned earlier, uh, but all whales and marine mammals are protected by the Marine Mammal Protection Act of 1972. Now the primary objectives of this act is to prevent marine mammal species and stock from diminishing to the point where they're no longer significant uh, functioning parts of their ecosystem. Uh, now it's also to help restore these diminished stocks to their optimal sustainable population. Um, in this act there are also guidelines given for best practices and how close you can get to these animals, how close you can approach them. Now in general for whales uh, they shouldn't be approached within 100 yards or 300 feet. Uh, but it really depends on their conservation status. Um, so for instance, the North Atlantic right whales are one of the most critically endangered uh, marine mammals in the world. Um, and so they're not to be approached within 500 yards, 1,500 feet. Now, one of the whales that we can see in our waters are blue whales. These guys, they have a global distribution. Uh, so again, you can see this dark blue area is where they can be seen in the world. So they are listed as endangered throughout their range. So globally, they are considered an endangered species. Uh, the blue whale is the largest animal in the world and the largest animal that has ever lived. Um, so it's reaching up to 110 feet and weighing just about 330,000 pounds. So these, these animals are incredible. Now, although they are the largest animals in the world, uh, their diet consists mainly of the smallest animals, uh, which is krill. Now some of the largest blue whales uh, can consume up to six tons of krill in one day. Uh, just in case you're not sure how much a ton is, a ton is 2,000 pounds and so these whales they can be eating up to 12,000 pounds of krill in a day. It's just incredible. Uh, so they are also one of the longest lived um, animals as well. And they're reaching somewhere between 80 to 90 years old. So they are found in all oceans except the Arctic Ocean. And there are five stocks of blue whales that are currently recognized. Now they can sometimes be seen traveling in small groups but are usually seen alone uh, or maybe in pairs. Now, in the early 1900s, the commercial whaling industry uh, significantly decreased their numbers. 
Um, however, their numbers are on the rise, um, but it is a slow rise. Um, the only solid numbers that we have for these animals uh, was a study done in the Gulf of Lawrence uh, in 2009, and only about 440 individuals were identified uh, during that study. Now the next whale I would like to talk about is the fin whale. Now the fin whale is the second largest uh, whale species after the blue whale. Uh, they're reaching about 75 to 85 feet in length uh, and weighing between uh, 40 and 80 tons, about 160,000 pounds. So while it's the second largest, it's not much smaller in length, um, but fin whales have a much more streamlined, sleeker body. So like the blue whales, fin whales are also considered an endangered species throughout its entire range. Uh, there are four different stocks of fin whales that are recognized, and the best estimate of their population uh, in the western North Atlantic comes from a study that was done in 2011, um, where about uh, 1,600 individuals were identified. Now these guys uh, get their name, the fin whale, from the prominent fin located on their back near their tail. So you can see this fin right here. Now, I think one of the most interesting thing about fin whales is their distinct coloration. Um, they are black or dark brownish gray on their backs, white on the underside, uh, but their head coloring is asymmetrical. Um, so if you look at this photo here, on their bottom jaw, the left side of their bottom jaw is a dark gray, and the right side is white. And so that's actually cut completely down, just right straight down the middle of their jaw. It's dark to black gray uh, on the left and white on the right. Um, and so it's actually opposite on their tongue. Um, so if they were to open their mouth, the left side would be normal tongue color, and the right side would be black color. Um, so it's always something that I have always thought that was really interesting uh, about these whales. So many uh, fin whales have these light gray, kind of V-shaped chevrons uh, behind their head. And they also have them um, on the underside of their tails and their fluke as well. Uh, now these markings are unique to each individual uh, and this is how they can be identified in the wild. Uh, fin whales are the fastest swimmers of the large whales and are often found in social groups of two to seven. Uh, in the North Atlantic, which is our region, uh, they are often seen feeding in large groups that include humpback whales, Mickey whales, and also Atlantic white-sided elephants. Now here we have the sperm whales, and like the fin whales and the blue whales, they are endangered throughout their range. Uh, so sperm whales are the largest of the toothed whales uh, and have one of the widest distributions of any marine mammal. I should explain that there are uh, toothed whales and baleen whales. Um, so toothed whales, they kind of have teeth like we do, um, and they are eating larger fish and animals, uh, whereas baleen whales, they have kind of those um, brush-like plates in their mouth. Um, and they kind of use them like big pasta strainers and they are eating the smaller fish and krill. 
So these guys are the largest of the toothed whale. Now they are found in all deep oceans from the equator uh, to the Arctic and Antarctic. And their scientific name is Physeter macrocephalus. Um, and so macro macrocephalus uh, means large head. And so you can see where they get that name from uh, with their very, very large head here. Um, so their head actually accounts for about one third of their body. Now their common name, uh, sperm whale, actually comes from the waxy substance in their heads called spermaceti. And this substance made them a prime target during, uh, during the whaling times. Um, and so this was actually used for oil and lubricants and candles. So sperm whales are sexually dimorphic. And that means that the males are larger than the females. Um, and so the females will reach about 40 feet in length and weigh up to 30,000 pounds, where the males will reach about 52 feet in length um, and will reach about 90,000 pounds. Um, so there's a really big difference there between males and females. Now sperm whales typically dive for their food um, and can dive to depths of about 2,000 feet. Um, that's their normal dive depth, but they are known to dive up to 10,000. Now their diet consists of squid, sharks, skates, and fish. Um, and sperm whales are often seen with uh, little circular scars around their mouth, and that is usually caused by the giant squid that they eat. Um, so while they're trying to eat them, um, the giant squid are actually holding on to the outside of their mouth. And so that's where they get those circular scars from, is from those suckers. Now with the large prey that they eat, their teeth are very interesting to me. <clears throat> they have between 20 and 26 teeth on each side of their bottom jaw. Um, but teeth on their top, top jaw rarely break through the gums. So it's really just those, that bottom jaw and those teeth um, and the sheer power of their jaw that allows them to eat such large prey. So how do these guys travel? Um, other than uh, large adult males, uh, sperm whales don't usually travel alone. Um, so females will form bonds with other females in their family, and they can be seen traveling together with their young. Uh, now these females will usually stay with their family group for their entire lives. Now the males, uh, once they reach a certain age, will leave the family group and find a group of other males uh, of about the same size and age that they are, and they'll travel around with them, and those are called bachelor schools. So as the males get larger, uh, they will kind of break away from those bachelor schools, and they will be traveling on their own. Now there's no exact <clears throat> count of the worldwide population of these animals, but the best estimate is between 300 and 450 of them worldwide. Here we have say whales. Um, so say whales can be seen in subtropical temperate and subpolar waters around the world and are often found with Pollock in Norway. Uh, the name say comes from the Norwegian word for Pollock. Um, so that's actually where they get their name from. Now today there are around uh, 8,600 say whales in the North Pacific. Uh, this is only a little more than 20% of the original population estimate uh, of 42,000 in that area. 
So the, the population of say whales in all the United States waters at the moment is unknown. The most recent data of the stock of say whales in the Western North Atlantic is from 1977. Uh, so in 1977, there were estimated to be between um, around 1,400 and 2,200 say whales in our region. So say whales have a long, sleek body uh, that is dark bluish gray to black in color and white or cream colored on the underside. Uh, and have a tall hooked dorsal fin, which is located about two thirds down on their body. So you can see that right here in this photo. So it's kind of similar to the fin whale um, where that, that dorsal fin is located further back on their body. So these guys are usually observed alone or in small groups of about two to five animals. Uh, now, something that I find interesting about them is the way that they dive. Um, so all other whales will dive head first with their fluke coming up out of the water before they start diving down to the depth. Now, these whales, uh, when they start to dive, instead of kind of going head first, they just simply sink below the surface. Uh, so they will often uh, leave a fluke print, which is just kind of smooth circles on the surface of the water, um, but they're not actually kind of diving in the normal way uh, that most whales do. Now they dive for their food, which includes plankton, small schooling fish, and squid, and they eat somewhere around 2,000 pounds of food per day. Hey, Nicole, can I interrupt you? We had a, a question that came up about, um, uh, have there been any sightings of the say, uh, say whale uh, in recent years on Long Island? Um, so they are seen. Um, they're seen a little bit less often um, because of the way that they dive. So if you were to go on whale cruises, um, most of the time you're gonna see humpback whales and maybe fin whales and minke whales, but because of the way that say whales dive and they just kind of sink below the surface, they're actually very hard to see when you're out there. So they may be there and we're not seeing them, um, but there have been confirmed sightings in recent years of say whales in our waters. Now the, the Migration patterns and the movement patterns of these animals are really not well known, um, but they are typically observed in kind of deeper waters and farther away from the coastline. Um, so they're, they're very pelagic animals. Now they also have an unpredictable distribution. Um, so many of the whales are found in one area for a period of time and then they won't return to that area for years um, or even decades. So their, their movements are really sporadic and very different uh, from a lot of the whales that we are used to seeing here. Um, it's very unusual for large whales um, who usually have a very predictable uh, migration pattern. Uh, but no one even knows where the say whales breed. So there's still a lot of research to be done with these animals. Now we have the North Atlantic right whale. Um, so you can see that their distribution here is much smaller than the whales that I have already discussed. Uh, now there are different kinds of right whales that are in other areas of the globe, uh, but this is where the North Atlantic right whales can be found. Now these guys, they are one of the world's most 
critically endangered large whale species. Um, there are two other species of right whales. Um, there's the North Pacific right whale that are found in the Pacific Ocean and the Southern right whale um, that can be seen in the Southern Hemisphere. Now by the late uh, 1890s rather, uh, right whales were hunted in the Atlantic to the brink of extinction. Right whales get their name because they were considered the right whales to hunt. Uh, now this is because after being killed, instead of sinking, their bodies would actually float at the surface. And so this made it much easier to be transported to shore and meant that the whalers could travel further out into the oceans to hunt them. Um, so their populations really suffered because of this. Uh, there are only about 400 of these whales remaining in the world. Um, and there's fewer than 100 breeding females left. Now only 12 births have been observed in the last three calving seasons since 2017. Um, and that's less than one third of the previous annual birth rate for these whales. So this, together with an unprecedented 30 mortalities since 2017, um, led to um, the declaring of an unusual mortality event. And so this is accelerating a downward trend uh, for these animals. And so right now, the births are not exceeding the deaths that we're seeing. So it's very possible that we could see the extinction of these animals in the next several years. Um, so in North Atlantic right whales, they do primarily occur in Atlantic coastal waters um, or close to the continental shelf, um, although movements over deeper waters are known. Now they do migrate seasonally and may travel alone or in small groups. Now in the spring, in the summer, and into the fall, many of these whales can be seen uh, off New England and further north into Canadian waters where they feed and mate. Now each fall, uh, some of these whales will travel more than a thousand miles from feeding grounds to shallow coastal waters of South Carolina, Georgia, uh, and northeastern Florida. Um, so these waters in the southern United States are the only known calving area for this species. And so an area where the females regularly give birth during the winter. Now NOAA fisheries which is the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration has designated two critical habitat areas to provide um, important feeding, nursery, and calving habitat for the right whales. So like I was saying before, um, with the Marine Mammal Protection Act and the Endangered Species Act, not only are we trying to protect the animals themselves, but we're also trying to protect their habitat, their main habitat that they're using um, to help them facilitate a, a good life and um, good parameters and situations to be able to feed uh, and be able to nurse and uh, calve their young. Now, another way that we are trying to help the North Atlantic right whales are by identifying each animal. So their characteristic feature is these raised patches of rough skin that you can see here. And this is called callicides. Um, so it's all over their head. And now they appear white because of um, something called whale lice. Uh, each right whale has a unique pattern, and so scientists use these patterns to identify individual whales. <clears throat> and it's such, such a great tool for um, tracking population size and health, and um, they're doing aerial surveys to 
check on the population and uh, see which whales are breeding and calving. Um, or if they find, you know, if they see a smaller whale that maybe they haven't seen before, and now we know that there is a new calf uh, in the population. So there are uh, aerial and ship-based surveys um, and the North Atlantic Right Whale Consortium. Uh, they maintain a, a photo identification database um, and it's maintained by our partners at the New England Aquarium to help track the population. So I just wanted to touch a little bit on humpback whales. Um, so whaling of these animals had decreased their populations by about 95%. Um, so when the Endangered Species Act, it, yeah, tongue tied. Uh, when the Endangered Species Act was enacted, uh, all humpback whales were listed as endangered. Now with the protections placed upon them for their population, um, they did begin to grow, and currently out of 14 different stocks of humpback whales around the globe, only four of them are still considered endangered, and one is listen, listed as threatened. So this is just a success story that I wanted to share. So it just goes to show that with the proper protections for these animals, uh, the population can bounce back. So the common threats to these animals are entanglement and ingestion, uh, vessel strike, and ocean noise. So just like with the sea turtles, uh, these whales can confuse plastic bags in the environment for their natural food source, um, and they are subject to getting tangled up in fishing gear. Now this photo on the left here is showing um, and Atlantic, a North Atlantic right whale getting stuck in lobster pot. Uh, so this is something that unfortunately we see commonly with whales as well as leatherback sea turtles, uh, since they are both such pelagic species. Uh, now lobster pots, they are set on the bottom here, um, but in order for the boats to find them again, they are attached to a buoy at the surface via a rope. Um, so as these animals are traveling, it is really easy for them to get tangled up in these lobster pots. So there are actually um, specially trained teams to respond to entangled whales um, and sea turtles. And so NOAA, which again is the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Atmospheric Administration uh, trains special teams of people to go out and disentangle these animals in the water. Um, now the reason that there are specially trained teams is because it can be extremely dangerous to try to disentangle whale. So if they, if they move in the wrong direction, they can pull you into the water, they could hit you with a flipper or their tail. Uh, and so it can be really, really dangerous for this. Um, so if you were ever out on the boat and saw an entangled whale or sea turtle, it's always better to contact your local rescue agency and definitely not try to disentangle the animal yourself or absolutely don't get in the water uh, to try to disentangle an animal. Uh, we always uh, err on the side of caution. Uh, if they're entangled, it could be really easy for someone else to get entangled with them. Um, so always better to call uh, people who are familiar with these types of situations. Um, so if you were to call our organization, you would get in touch with the proper people to come um, that have the experience in disentangling the whales. So Nicole, we did have another question ab about the fishing gear. Um, have they made improvements to the fishing gear to um, try to avoid entanglement, um, like they kind of did with the turtle nets? Is there a escape route for 
I mean, they're a lot bigger animal, obviously. Yeah, unfortunately not. Um, just because it's, it's not that they're, it's the way that they swim and it kind of just gets stuck. You can see here that it gets kind of stuck on their flippers and if they change direction, it kind of moves and it can come up and over and that's how they get entangled. Um, something that has been worked on, uh, which I'll also touch on when we go to vessel strikes, um, is making sure that people are not laying down their pots in typical migratory areas for animals. Um, so there have been uh, satellite tags put on animals to kind of watch their movements and their and their distribution and their their migration patterns so that we can try to avoid um, having people the fishermen laying down in those areas. What kind of a whale is it that's on the right there in this last photo? On the right is a it's sperm whale. That's the sp the, both sperm whales there? Yeah. So yeah, on the left here is a North Atlantic right whale that's depicted, but okay. this, this photo right here is a sperm whale. So the sperm whale here is just, um, has all kinds of fishing line and stuff uh, wrapped around its bottom jaw. So vessel strikes are probably the most common reason for whale strandings that we see in New York State. Um, you can tell when they've been struck by a boat uh, due to the bruising that's seen in their tissues um, on the necropsy examination uh, after they stranded. Um, so this is, again, something that's being done to try to avoid these is looking at these animals' migration patterns um, and when they are kind of more likely to be in these ship lanes. Uh, trying to decrease the amount of vessel traffic during those times, uh, but also having the people on the boats more aware of these animals in the area and looking out for them. Um, some companies, they go as far as um, hiring marine mammal observers on their boats specifically there to look for them. Now, ocean noise is another big issue for these guys. Um, so this photo here is showing a whale hunting for food. Now, ocean noise, whether it be from sonic testing or mil military testing or uh, general boat traffic can disrupt the behavior of these animals. So for whales, their hearing is extremely important to them. Uh, they're listening for sounds from hundreds of miles away and they're using to find food, uh, to socialize with other animals, and to find mates. Um, now there was a study done that showed under the right conditions, blue whales can hear each other from a thousand miles away, uh, which I think is just incredible. Um, so any kind of noise in the water can disrupt their ability to hear one another and find the food that they're looking for. Um, so I mentioned marine mammal observers um, in the previous slide. There are, um, with sonic testing, these boats are actually required to have marine mammal observers on their ships looking for whales in the area. Um, so, if a marine mammal observer sees a whale within a certain distance from the ship, they have to cease and desist uh, their actions until the whales move out of the area uh, so that they are not affecting um, these animals negatively. Now, why should we care about protecting whales? 
Um, so there's a lot of different reasons. And they're huge, huge contributors for regulating the food. Uh, like I said earlier, uh, blue whales, they can eat 12,000 pounds of fish and krill in a day. Um, other whales are eating between 2,000 and 6,000 pounds of fish and krill in a day and other food. Um, so they're having such a large impact on that food chain. They're also prey for other animals. So even though they're very large, um, other animals do eat them. They're eaten by sharks and also other whales. Um, so they are still part of the food chain in that way as well. Then also whale falls. Um, so whale falls is when a whale dies of natural causes and will sink to the bottom of the sea. Um, now their carcass can support marine biological communities for years or even decades. Um, so the entire marine communities uh, can be impacted by their disappearance. Now nutrient cycling, um, by consuming matter deep um, in the deep nutrient rich water, um, they're fertilizing nutrient poor water. So whales help mix the water column uh, and spread essential nutrients that's needed in these ocean communities. Now also by, by defecating, their feces actually help to stimulate growth of plankton and micro other uh, microorganisms uh, that are the foundation of all oceanic food chains. Um, so really important, um, really important things going on here. Um, and then carbon cycling. So whales accumulate large amounts of carbon in their bodies over their lifetime. Uh, so when they pass away and sink to the bottom, that carbon is carried to the sea floor. Um, so it's just incredible how important and what effects these guys really have on the marine ecosystem. So they're very important here. So what can you do uh, to help these animals? You know, if you see an animal in distress, you definitely want to be sure to call the New York State Rescue Hotline number. Uh, that number is listed right here. So this is a 24-hour number. So um, this is for seals, sea turtles, dolphins, porpoises, and whales. Um, so this is a really great number to have. It's the only one for New York State. Um, so you might want to write that down. Now, another thing that's not listed here, but is also a really good thing to do is just to respect these animals' space. Um, so if you're out on a boat and you see these animals in the water, um, you know, sometimes they will approach a boat. So the best thing to do is kind of to just shut your engine off and hang out uh, while they're in the area, let them do their thing. And then once they have gone, uh, restart and uh, leave the area. That way you are not disturbing them. Now something else that you can do is donate to organizations that conduct research to protect these animals um, and to help preserve their species. You can also become a citizen scientist as well, um, reporting sightings, um, helping of organization, nonprofit organizations that are doing research um, and becoming involved yourself um, in the research. So we, I, I, we have a couple questions. I guess the first question I'd like to ask is, if you, um, you wanted to volunteer to be like one of the people that walk the beaches. Um, looking for, you know, cold stung uh, turtles or something, would they call that same um, uh, 369 number? So that's our rescue hotline number. Um, if you're interested in helping us look for cold stung sea turtles on the beach, you will want to visit our website. 
Okay. Um, so that is www.nymarinerescue.org. Um, so there are um, dates on our calendar of events for cold stun sea turtle lectures and trainings to learn about that. Um, and there's also a place to put in uh, applications for the volunteer program on our website as well. And we did have another question. Um, let's see if I can unmute. We have someone that said they saw a, um, a whale out at West Hampton Beach, uh, believed to be a baleen whale. Uh, let's see if I could unmute her if she wanted to ask. Um, if you want to unmute yourself, Justine, you can. Oh, um, I did. Am I, yeah. Can you hear me? Yes. I sure can. Uh, my uh, son was at West Hampton Beach Ocean last week, and it was less like 200 yards. He saw like the water churning around, and unbelievable, a whale came right up out of the water. He could see the baleen as it scooped up all the fish that were in that area, and then it, it disappeared, but it was like, I, of course I asked, did you take a picture? But it was, <laughs> it was one of those things. And the other, uh, I don't know if it was one of those North Atlantic ones. I mean, which ones would come that far into the Hamptons? And my second part you can answer is, mm. our waters are awfully warm. You hear about the dolphins in, in our, near Bug Light, and the, the, of course you hear about the sharks, and also um, other species uh, that are coming closer down Long Island where they used to be in more of the North Atlantic. Is the water or climate change affecting all of these uh, species now? Um, so for whales in our area, usually the most common ones that we're going to see are humpback whales. Um, so we've gotten lots and lots of sightings of humpback whales uh, in our area. Um, so that is likely the one that uh, he saw. I can't, so obviously, I can't say 100% for sure uh, without seeing any photos or anything, but it is uh, a I common mean, it thing. Would come, it would come that close that he actually saw the baleen and the fish going right in, and yeah. then, of course, it went down. Yeah. It was, you know, it was the day, and made his day, believe me. <laughs> he couldn't wait to tell us, but I can see the water so warm. I mean, it yes. was warm and I, I, I would think that that was a hindrance to a lot of these species. I don't yeah, know. It, it is very warm, and so the, the warming waters seem to be bringing in more of the kind of bait fish and the food source. What kind of fish? The bait fish. So it's more like bunker and okay. like the, the fish that they're feeding on. Um, so they're, it's kind of bringing these fish more into the area and so we're seeing the animals that are eating these fish more often as well. Aren't they in more danger if they're coming closer to the shore that they might uh, get uh, you know stuck? <laughs> yeah unfortunately it is it can be a side effect um, you know they're coming in contact with more boat traffic as well um, Unfortunately, there's not much that we can do about it, except for try to monitor the situation and um, keep an eye on the animals that we get uh, sighting reports. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, if there um, isn't any other questions, I would uh, encourage you to check out their website, uh, newyorkmarinerescue.org. And um, if nobody else has any questions, thank you so much for joining us tonight.